Oh, as advertised tonight, we have a super special guest. We're just trying to get on his good side. Uh, he's going to have to be leaving shortly, so we'll get right into his presentation, ladies and gentlemen. At large, Tom Councilman from Cumberland, Art Landy. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Tea Party members, for having me here tonight. Um, for those of you, I, I do have to leave this evening around 6.45, so I, what I plan on doing is making a presentation for about 30 minutes, and then I'd, I'd like to leave a solid um, 15 minutes for questions and answers, because I'm sure um, some of you may have um, some questions based on uh, some of the things that have transpired over the last few weeks and a few months since uh, I took office in November. But uh, my name is Art Lambie. I'm a town councilman at large here in Cumberland. We have two at-large seats which represent the entire town of Cumberland. Then we have five uh, district seats for the town council composing a seven-member council that, um, that balances our town government with uh, the mayor's office. I'm a CPA by trade. I've been in town for 15 years. I actually have a, a CPA practice here in town. Uh, so I've spent my entire career auditing financial statements, preparing tax returns, and uh, dealing with businesses and clients who are um, engaging in various financial tractions, uh, transactions, um, consolidating, merging, buying, selling, retiring, um, deciding to take one position over another. Um, all sorts of things that I've, I've, I've done and, and assisted people with, and it's been uh, quite, quite a learning experience over the last 25 years of uh, working as a certified public accountant here in Rhode Island. I started with one of the big uh, eight CPA firms when I was a kid out of Rhode Island College. Um, I actually started my academic career at CCRI. So when it comes to schooling, I know firsthand what it means about going to a public school like Attleboro High School, what it means to going to CCRI and paying your own way, and getting the most out of your own education not relying on others to do that. I also know that education doesn't require a lot of money if you don't want it to. Uh, and then from there, I went to Rhode Island College. I graduated early. I graduated a semester early from Rhode Island College. Why? Because of my parents making sure that I, I had a place to study and a home to do my homework at. It didn't mean I didn't have to work. I worked my way entirely through college, as I'm sure a lot of you folks did in, in, in this room. Um, but Rhode Island College graduate, um, I graduated semester early, I sat for the CPA exam early, I passed some parts early, got a good job out of college, worked for a large local CPA firm, and then I started my own business at the age of 28, which I've been doing for, for about 20 years now. So I also know how to run a business, and at the same time advise other folks about their personal finances and businesses, uh, business finances. So that's what I, I do for a living. I have a wonderful wife of 26 years, Susan, two beautiful girls, uh, Jessica and Nicole, uh, 21 and 17. Jessica's graduating from Roger Williams University with an accounting degree this spring, and Nicole is graduating from Bishop Fian High School um, this spring, and she's going to be going to Fairfield University to be a teacher of mathematics. Um, my oldest daughter is graduating with an accounting degree. I'm really excited for her. She's got that financial background, and hopefully she can do some great things with it once she graduates. Um, why Bishop Fian for me? Why Bishop Fian for me and not Cumberland High School for my girls? Um, we left that decision to our girls. Um, they had a lot of friends that they were friends with through uh, the Cumberland School System, Community School, and North Cumberland Middle School. Um, but when it came to high school, we allowed them to make the choice, and we supported them in their choice for Bishop Fian. That, that choice had a lot to do with prayer before each school, the use of God without any shame, um, Father-daughter dances being called just that. Supportive faculty and staff. Not that you don't get that at the Cumberland High School, but our girls made a conscious decision that that's what they wanted to do, and we supported them financially in their decision. Why am I here tonight? Uh, I was asked by Mr. Perry in the, in the, in the tea, tea Party to talk a little bit about um, primarily the, the uh, I guess the vote that was taken a couple weeks ago relative to the tax levy. Um, issue here in, in the town of Cumberland, uh, which I will touch upon briefly, and 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 since we do have a couple extra minutes, because I, I really don't want to spend the whole th whole night on that particular issue, um, I like to bring you up to date on um, as much as I can now that I'm kind of on the inside as a counselor um, about the uh, contract position with our, our police department here in town, and if we have time after those two uh, items, uh, I'd like to touch upon fire consolidation. 
And then if we still have more time, we can talk about school funding and some of that information. Okay. Um, there's a relatively small group here. I think we might be able to um, have some questions as we go. But I, I will try to stay on track so I can get through the majority of the topics, just so um, in case you're here for one reason or another, I can get through them all. But uh, if you do have a question, um, let's talk about it. And if we need to, I'll just get us back on track and, and try to get through um, the material. But um, the police pension and he lifetime health insurance promises. Cumberland's uh, police department has its own private pension. And this pension, um, unfortunately, um, is basically broken at this point, at 31% funded. Most pension plans have at least 80 cents on a dollar supporting the promises of the plan and the future promises, 80 cents on a, on a dollar. So if you think, the actuaries think the promises someday are gonna be worth 50 million bucks, they have at least $80 million or about $40 million in investments backing up those assets. The town of Cumberland has 31 cents backing up its promises. And the actuaries tell us if you get below 60% funded, you basically at that point, you, your plan is at risk of financially breaking right in half. Um, some claims that are un, un, unscheduled, a decline, temporary decline in, in market securities and investments, and you may not have the money there to actually pay um, the, the recipients um, the promises the town has made. It's a very, very serious problem. We all know our police officers. We all adore them and the work that they do. And it's not fair that many of them have been working for this town for many, many years, and now all of a sudden they may not have a pension plan, or at least not the one that they signed up for. So that issue is a big one for this town. Why? Because in addition to that pension plan promise, we've also promised them lifetime health insurance benefits. So when they retire, they get life insurance for them, for them and their family, currently under the existing plan at no cost, um, pretty much for the rest of their life. Some recent changes have, have put them into Medicare at age 65, um, so that will certainly help and has helped reduce some of the obligation for the town. But let me, let me talk about what these numbers actually mean and what the obligation is for the town. When you add up the pension obligation and the lifetime health insurance, um, that number, is, is currently about $5.5 million. Let's put that in perspective. The town, based on the recent actions of the mayor's office, is levying about $60 million in property taxes per year. All right, so $60 million comes from the town, 5.5 million bucks of that is supposed to be going towards the pension and the health insurance promise. How much is actually being paid into those plans right now? About $2.8 million. So the actuaries are telling the town, you need to put five and a half million dollars aside for pensions and, and, and these life insurance uh, and these health insurance promises, but the town is only putting aside 2.8 million bucks. Which means every year that goes by, we're getting three million dollars further in the hole. If we wanted to fully fund those promises the way they're currently negotiated and drafted right now, the town would need to come up with an extra three million dollars. That's a 5% tax increase just to take care of that. Mm -hmm. Never mind what the school wants for funding. Never mind that the town has a self-imposed tax cap of 3%. Can't raise its taxes more than 3%. 3% of 60 million is about $1.8 million. Right about the amount, the entire amount that the school department is asking for next year. So the school department's asking for us to levy the maximum tax and that's going to go to that department. What's left for the other departments in town to run government? What's left to fix our broken pension plan and OPEP? That's OPEP's another word for the lifetime health insurance. And also, what I think has been forgotten, and the message I tried to send to the mayor's office uh, with a few folks on town council a couple weeks ago, and that is the taxpayers. What about them? Are you interested, are they interested in a 3% tax hike this year? And are they interested in a 3% tax hike next year? Because that's what you would need to do in order to fully fund these obligations. So the state has asked the town of Cumberland 
listen, your pension plan is broken at 31% funded. You need to come up with a remediation plan. You need to come up with a plan that will fix this. This town council hired an actuary. This town council studied those actuarial reports. This town council, with the mayor's office and the advice of uh, attorneys, drafted a remediation plan, four pages long. We submitted it to the plan, uh, to the state. That same document was given um, to, the, to the police union as far as um, elements that the town was looking at based on an actuarial study that needed, needed to be looked at relative to some of the promises that were made on the pension and the life, 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 lifetime health insurance. So that plan was drafted, became a public document just a couple of months ago, maybe a month and a half ago. And um, again, I don't want to comment on negotiations, but the police contract has been outstanding and, and open for three years. And I am hoping as a counselor, and I think that the residents of Cumberland are hoping that the time has come for a contract to be negotiated after three years, and that we will have one sooner rather than later, and that that contract will include some of the elements of the remediation plan that the town council and the mayor put forth so that we can curtail the annual payment into these two plans. Now, let me tell you, if the police union accepts the remediation plan as drafted, our actuaries tell us and this is right in the remediation plan itself, that the annual required contributions for both the health insurance and the pension going forward, if they accept it as we presented it, will be $2.8 million, which is exactly what the town is currently spending today. Now let's think about that. If the police union accepted that remediation plan as presented, and we were able to keep what we're currently spending in cash, $2.8 million, a year, that line didn't change. And if we now had a three-year contract with the police department, what would that do as, us, as far as the town council and the ability to manage our, the rest of our budget? If, they, if, we don't, if, if that doesn't happen, what do we have now? We have a contract that's still open. We have potentially an annual obligation that we haven't been paying that's $3 million more than we've been currently putting aside. Where are we going to get that money? It makes it for a very, very difficult decision-making process if we can't get that contract signed and know what our obligation is going to be. And if we can get it to be $2.8 million, that's currently what the town is budgeting. So there's no need for a tax increase. And if there was a tax increase, maybe it could go to fund our schools. Maybe it could go to improve our roads. Maybe it could go to improve our water quality and, and invest in and, and wells and that type of stuff. So the bottom line on the police, the police contract is the town council and the taxpayers need some certainty. We need to know where we're going with the budget. And it's important. Nobody wants to renege on promises and not put money into a pension plan, at least not me. So if the town has the obligation, I don't want to pay just 2.8. I want to pay the whole boat. But I also realize that we've got other departments that need money too. And these are different times. And the remediation plan has been put forth. And um, the plan contains uh, contract changes, pension ch changes to the pension plan, and, and lifetime health insurance promises that are no different no different than what you see in other municipalities. You pick up the newspaper every day and you see what some of these other cities and towns, suspended colas, um, more years of on the job before you can retire, those types of things. Um, the last thing we want to do is end up as a town with a broken pension plan and that we can't fulfill our promises. I don't think that's any, in anybody's agenda. Um, any quick questions on that? I mean, maybe there's a lot of questions on that, but let's, we got a few minutes. Anybody? So where does that stand right now? So right now it's in negotiations. So that's why I, I can't say too, too much more other than um, a plan has been put forth. All those details are a public record. 
Um, they had to be as part of the state's requirement to come up with a remediation plan, which was due in November. Um, but it was not presented until, um, I think, until February or maybe March. So um, we are hopeful as a council that the, the mayor's office will um, conclude the negotiations with the police union um, shortly. But um, that's really all I can offer you at this point. If that doesn't fly. There's never a guarantee that it will, I don't think. At least in my mind, anyway. And hopefully, it may look good, and I know you can't contract on this particular, you can't comment on particulars, but if that doesn't fly, where do we stand? Um, the remediation plan was very clear, so I don't feel I'm, I'm speaking out of context. Public record, um, it stated that the remediation plan included um, some negotiations that needed to take place, and if not, um, some type of legal action or ordinance changes that the um, the town um, the town could consider. Um, so l let me just say that there's certainly a plan B um, if that doesn't work out, and um, you know we're hopeful it will. But if it doesn't, um, we're, we're being proactive to make sure that. It does get fixed and, and, and doesn't end up um, breaking up taxpayers back, breaking the pension back, or forcing us to do something drastic with other departments, particularly the school departments. That would string it out even further all over you. Even if, if you had to go to plan B, it would tend to string the whole thing out a little further down the line. When you say the whole thing, it would create more uncertainty for us, well, I, well, right? I, I, and that's I, really... And any time you're making a financial decision, the more certainty you have, because nothing's perfect. So the more certainty you have, the better your decision's going to be, or at least the more comfort you have in making that decision. But um, it, you know, to make promises, um, for, particularly, you know, what's, what's, what's real troubling is when, it, when the town council makes a, a, an appropriation to the school department. I think most people know in this room that once you make that promise this year, you have to pay it next year. So it's, you're raising the bar, to, there's no flexibility, it keeps going up. So if you knew what that bill was going to be for the police pension and the OPEP, you could work that into the entire formula, and then you could, you could work in the school funding and the tax increase if there needed to be one, and map out that three-year plan for the, for the taxpayer, that's my belief. But with, with that uncertainty, how can you make a, a big promise to any department, whether it be the water department, the highway department, the school department, knowing you have the uncertainty in the police pension. Unless you know Don right well that you're not going to pay that bill and you're going to turn your backs on him, which I don't think anybody wants to do at the town level. So we'd like to get it done with some certainty and with, with a contract and we can all go back to work and, and then properly plan financially for, for, for the town's overall financial picture. When the, prom <clears throat> excuse me. When the promise was made to the school department, I understand you know, they have to be funded too. But wasn't everyone aware that once you make this promise, that's your next level? I think everybody who was making that decision uh, was aware of that. Um, I'm not sure that all taxpayers are aware of that, and, and I think there might have been some more support one way or another had, had more people of the community understood that, you know, if you give... So Wednesday night we're going to vote. We're going to take a vote on the extra, the, the last of the million dollar promise, three hundred thousand dollar promise. So we're going to approve, um, potentially approve a three million dollar allocation to the school department. That be, be, falls into maintenance of effort, and next year will be a three hundred thousand dollar bill. The town is going to have to continue to pay to the school department. Three hundred thousand dollar bill per year. Let's think about that. If you had three hundred thousand dollars a year, how much money? Could you borrow today at 4% and pay back over the next 20 years? In other words, if the town got a bond at 4% and was going to repay that bond over 20 years with $300,000 per year, you could borrow $4 million. bucks. So this $300,000 is really a $4 million investment as far as I'm concerned. Because you could go borrow $4 million, build a new building, build an addition, and then have the same $300,000 bill. It's a big investment. It's not $289,700. It's a $4 million investment. That's the way I look at it. And I'm not sure my fellow counselors see it the same way. 
but that's how I see it. And I, and I, you got to look at those dollars. You have to look at if it's if it's somewhat discretionary. If you make it a capital contribution to the school department, it's not a permanent. Then it's not maintenance of effort. So if it was a three hundred thousand dollar payment for capital improvements, it's a little bit easier because next year that's not it's not the starting point. But if it's, it becomes maintenance of effort, it's, it's again, it's already built into the, the program next year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to my, the next element here because I wanna make sure I get through at least uh, three topics. Um, the tax levy being the next one and then fire consolidation. The uh, tax levy. So what happened a couple weeks ago was um, the mayor came to, the mayor came to the town council and said, thanks. I have a resolution and I would like to levy, um, May 1st, I would like to levy an approximate amount, approximate amount of tax. I would like to levy between 59 million and 61 million. The mayor came to the town council and said, I would like your permission um, on lines 21 and 22 of this resolution that I'm giving you. Um, I would like to levy between 59 million and 61 million. So the town council, myself included, asked some questions. Like, how much did we levy last year? Um, about 59 and a half million. What's the property tax levy for budget for the current year? About 58.7 million dollars. 58.7 million dollars. How are we trending in the current year? How are our collections? Good, above average, head of budget. Okay, then why do we need $61 million? So how much was the surplus last year on the town side of the budget? A million two. Our levy was $58 million, $59 million. We had a million two surplus last year. And the year before, we had a $4 million surplus. So we've got two years of surpluses. We've got a trending property tax line that's positive. And the mayor comes to the town council and says, well, I want 61, between 59 and 61 million. The town council discussed it. We took a vote. And I made a, an amendment to this resolution that suggested that the, the, the amount on line 22 of 61 million be reduced to 60 million. So the mayor still had an amount that was lower than my amount. He was still suggesting that his levy could be as low as 59 million. All I did was reduce the cap from 61 million to 60 million. So I, I was providing a range that was a little smaller. He had to, he had to hit that bullseye a little tighter. And it was between 59 and 60. He was the one that came up with the 59, not me. I would not have proposed a levy that was less than this 59. That would have been irresponsible. So I proposed a max, I reduced the maximum from 61 million to 60 million. He still had his minimum of 59, and there was a range of about a million bucks. A vote was taken, the amendment passed, four to three, and the mayor pleaded with the council to um, revote. And, and remove the amendment and, and max it back out to $61 million, which the council did. One of the council members, uh, Mr. DaCosta, um, called for a, a vote, a revote, and uh, another vote was taken, and um, um, this resolution passed as is, providing for a range between 59 and 61 million instead of a range that I had proposed, which was 59 and 60 million. Now, I was accused in the paper, or by the mayor, of being irresponsible with that amendment. But um, the mayor's own resolution had a potential collection that was actually less than my, my, my cap. Okay, That's one point I, I want to bring up about that. Um, so the levy, the levy that's gonna, that you'll get, this tax bill that you'll get this year, is going to reflect a tax rate of about $15.77, up 1% from $15.61. Um, it's 
okay? And about 40% of that $60 million levy that he's gonna, that the bills are gonna come out in May, about 40% of that is gonna fall in the fiscal year that we're currently in that will end in June. The other 60% in round numbers will fall in next year's budget. So we already know as a town council that our property tax levy next year is 60% times 60 plus whatever we levy next year. But what I, what I want to point out to everybody in the room, it's not just about the 1% increase this year. If you go to the last page of this handout, This was provided to the town council by the uh, finance director's office. And if you look at the levy in 2008, it was 50 million. We're now over $60 million from 2008. I don't want to remind people, because you probably already know what's happened to your house values since 2008. I don't want to remind you what's happened to your fixed income, something that was supposed to be fixed, or to your wages since 2008. But I can tell you, based on audited numbers provided to me from the town, that the money pulled from the community and into town government has increased by over $10 million in the last, uh, I don't know, what is that, four or five years. It's not even so much that it's $10 million in four or five years. It's about during the time it was, it was increased. Let's think about that. Declining home sales, 20 to 25% during that same time frame. Stagnant or declining family incomes and um, taxes that have increased by $10 million. So you've got, you've got a little history there and you can do some of your own math. I've, I've done a 10 year, I've gone all the way back 10 years to the 42 million and, and figured that it's averaged about a 5% increase per year. We had a couple of years that they were really some big spikes and there were some, some reasons for those, but they were still, whether you have a reason or not, it's, it's, still, it's still a tax increase. You know, whether, whether there's a good reason or not. If I say I'm going to levy a, if I'd, I'd suggest a 10% tax increase on all the taxpayers to fix the pension plan. It's a good reason, but I'm still asking the taxpayers to pay 10% more. If you're having all these increases, where is that money going in view of the fact that your, your police pension fund is underfunded and uh, you know, you've got multiple fire departments, which a lot of the towns in Rhode Island have the same problem. We live in Lincoln. I mean, you know, our town administrator said he's given them a chance to, to consolidate. They won't. He says, I'm going to consolidate for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a couple of reasons. One is um, we did some, we, during this same time frame, we, we built some schools and some additions here in town. Um, so we've had to, to float those bonds, come up with those bills. Um, secondly, um, the state reduced some of our funding um, a few years ago when, when the financial you-know-what hit the fan and they cut our funding by about four or five million bucks and the town was left with a town government. And you have to remember, most town government services you know, you plan on them being there, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, we would all like to reduce the size of government, most people in this room particularly, but um, there are certain services that, you know, you, you need to have and you want to have and you want it to be there for when you need it. Um, so when, the, again, when you're talking about a $5 million bill, let's put it in relative terms. We're talking about a couple of years ago, when that happened, our, our levy was around 51 million bucks. That was 10% of our levy. Gone. What do you do? What do you do? So um, the, town, the, the town at the time, they had to increase some taxes, um, mostly in the form of car taxes that year, back then. Exceeded the tax cap. Um, got permission from the state to exceed the tax cap um, for various reasons, primarily um, you know, funding the bonds at the school and um, the, the lack of funding from the state. So, um, the levy. It's difficult. Um, there's a lot of different ways to measure it. 
In Lincoln, they have homestead exemptions. Um, there's all different ways to slice it and dice it. I think the best way to analyze it is you take your total tax base, which in Cumberland is about uh, $3.6 billion, and then you compare that to the total tax levy, which is about $60 million. That gives you how much of the property value is actually going into town government. And we could do that same calculation, and trust me, I will be doing that over the next few weeks in surrounding communities. But I think what's important is when you have a tax rate that is reasonable, it tends to help people to afford to stay in a community, which keeps houses from being foreclosed on or from being liquidated and put on the market, which sat saturates the market, which depletes everybody's house value, and it snowballs in the wrong direction. Cumberland needs to be a community of balance, meaning we need to have decent schools. We need to have a pension plan that's not ready to break the financial back of the town. It needs to be adequately funded. We need to have a tax rate that people can afford to pay and still live in the community. It's a balancing, it's a juggling act. It's not easy. And the more I learn, the more I learn it's, it's not easy. But um, I do know that I feel, as a taxpayer, and one of the main reasons I ran for public office was I felt the taxpayers, the tax rate part of the moderation, is it's a whole piece of a pie. In other words, you make a decision to live in a community because it's safe, because it's got decent schools, because you can afford to live there from its taxes. The houses are reasonable price, but they're a little above market, like they are in Cumberland. Why? Because we run a balanced community. We don't overextend ourselves for, with schools. So those are the things. It, it's, a, it's a giant juggling act. And um, when you look at the amount of tax increases, the total levy increase over the last four or five years, um, it's been a big number. And I really think what the, what the taxpayers were saying in, in November is, we need a little bit of relief. We need a break. We need, a, we need to take a step back first. Let's just take a step back. I would love to do that as a counselor relative to the tax rate. And I would love to get some that remediation plan implemented and get the police union to embrace it and, and get that contract signed. And then I would like to take what we, what we might be able to find in this budget and future tax increases that are modest and that improve the community and use it to improve our schools, improve our drinking water, and improve our roads. That's the plan. But it's a process. It's a process. But this, this schedule gives you folks an idea of where we've been as a community relative to tax levy over the last several years. Any questions on that, Mr. Lemoyne? So maybe, of that money that you're saying was collected before the tax levy, it's actually the cash that comes into town. How much of that cash was from the actual current homeowners versus new tax base. Well, <clears throat> what was the amount split? Well, let's put it this way, um, Mr. Lemoy. The last, this past year when we were doing this budget, um, the, the levy was about $59.5 million. And the, the increase in the tax base, in other words, if you left the tax rate exactly the same, the tax levy, because of new home, homes or new businesses that were brought into the community, was going to increase by $300,000 for one year. For one year. All right, so $300,000. So, so the town council increased taxes, increased the rate a bit, which was the equivalent of take, grabbing about another 600000 from existing homeowners and then another 300,000 from new, new, new homes and new businesses in the existing year. Back in those prior years, um, you know, I, I've got to say, we've pro we probably had a lot of houses come off the tax rolls due to um, foreclosure. Um, the, banks the, the banks still pay for those. But the, uh, the value is basically what I'm, what I'm talking about. We had a, a lot of loss in, in value in town and uh, certainly um, probably more loss in value than we had any increase in um, tax base. So you're saying that that total amount was on the backs of the homeowners and not in value increases then? You just said that. I'm not understanding it. I really want to understand it. So 
is it so what's the question? Is the tax collections on the back of the current homeowners or because of increase in values? You just said two different things. Well, the put it this way, the tax collections have increased ten million dollars. Okay, but how much of that is on the current homeowners versus value increase? All of it's extra on the current. Homes, no, all, extra, extra houses coming on the market, values. Let's uh, put it. We'll put it in tax, perspective. Tax, tax agreements going away, so now businesses are paying taxes where they weren't. If if the t if the tax base this year increased by three hundred thousand due to new tax base, okay. let's multiply it times four years. It's right. one point two million out of ten million. Well, you can't do that because you know what spikes it was. I'm asking you. You know that ten million dollars, not average. There really weren't spikes between two thousand eight and two and two thousand twelve. That's okay, Mr. Lee. That's fine. Um, no. so what, what, hold on. Our, our, our taxes go up every year, and Mr. Lemoy was on the town council for quite a while. And every year taxes go up. They never cut spending. My pay doesn't go up. And I was talking to Mr. Higgins last year, and he told me that if I couldn't afford to pay the taxes, move out of town. You know? And then I see sour grapes. You know, taxes go up every year. It's got to end. It's got to end. Thank you for your comment. And I, I think you do a much better job than this man over here. Thank you. Thank Mike. you. I appreciate the support. Mike. See, I, I wasn't done, Mr. Perry. I got one more question, if you don't mind. One more, Mr. Lemoy, because sure. there are other questions, and we have another segment I want to get to. Right. You just said that the tax rate increases have to be, you said, what, moderate? Um, That's what you use with moderate. So my question is, is a 1% tax increase a moderate tax increase? If not, what is, in your mind, a moderate tax increase? Mr. Perry has uh, a comment. I'll answer that question no, for you, Bruce, no. if you don't mind. No, I, he's, I want to understand what his definition is well, of a moderate tax increase. All right. he said, you can get his, because he's not going to agree with me, probably, so I'll give you mine, all right? See, but I don't know what the councilman's opinion yeah. is. When he said tax increases, have to Go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. ahead. Say, I want to hear first. All right. This is the tea party, all right? Tea means tax enough already. I'm not disagree with that. All right, I'm talking, please. What that means is we want people to get control of the taxes and how they're spending them, right. okay? We're not opposed to any kind of tax increase. We're not opposed to any kind of growth in government. What we want to know is that our money is being spent wisely, and that has not always been the past, either in town government, state government, or federal government. That's number one. Number two, when you have any kind of tax increase, right, that is greater than the increase in the income of the people of your community, that's going to be an onerous tax increase. If you're increasing taxes by 1% in this town, Bruce, and the people in this town are losing income, that is an onerous tax increase. No, that is not moderate. That is too great. I accept that, but my question was to Mr. Lamey, when he said... All right, Mr. Lamey can answer now. Mr. Tax, tax I want to get my two cents in, because okay. it's going to be leaving. So I want to move to the next segment, because I am running a little bit... Question, Mr. Lamey. What is a moderate... He I, said tax increases have to be moderate. What is a moderate tax increase? I think I have to agree there with... So one percent is not a moderate tax increase. It has to be in the context, as Mr. Perry said. So one percent is not moderate to you. I'm not... Listen. I'm not going to have you put words in my mouth. I'm not, I'm right. not just you Mr. Lemoy, I'm done with it. Thank okay. you. No All right, so no listen, problem. Mike, I'm sorry, you that's, had one question. Okay. And maybe you. you can weave in your answer in your next segment. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a parent of, of two boys that are, are just starting out in the Carmelo School Department. Um, actually, one that's not even in the school department yet, uh, pre K. Um, so I'm saying I have concerns. I've been in town about 10 years. Um, and I hear about the struggles that the school department's going through. We've all read about how um, the Cumberland schools have the lowest per pupil expense in the entire state and have, and have maintained that for, for a number of years going back in history. Um, and we understand that there's this $290,000 uh, vote this week and, and, we're, and the town council is entered, entering this town budget phase. Um, so, are you suggesting from, from this police pension conversation that the town essentially needs to freeze spending until that issue is crystal clear? Is that? That's a, that's a really good point, and that's like a good perspective or spin on the comments that I'm making today. To a certain degree, you could almost, I, I would almost say, that, almost say that, but the challenge we have with the money that's allocated to the, 
to the school department is that if you agree for this year that you can afford to give the, the school department an extra million dollars, and then next year you find out because of the police contract, you can't afford that million, you still got to pay it. That's the challenge that we've got as a town council is that it becomes maintenance of effort. It becomes a permanent bill. If it wasn't a permanent bill, it would be a much easier decision. Mm -hmm. My decision on Wednesday would be one of a yes vote for the 300000 if it was this year only. <clears throat> but if the town has got to be strapped in for another million dollars next year, on t and that's, that's last year's promise, so they're already in for an extra million, and now we're being, the town's asked for another $1.6 million. 2.6 million increase. It's how can the town afford? They can only levy the maximum of 1.7 million or thereabouts. How is it going to do that? How does this math add up? And what about the other departments, the rescue department that we all count on? That we have the best rescue department in the state. Two paramedics show up to your door. It's the best one around. It's a bargain. What if they need something? What if our police department needs it? What if our pension needs to be just fixed up and propped up so that we can move forward and get that contract signed? Um, so we, we, we have, and, and, I, and I, we're going to look harder, I, tr I trust. If it's not this budget season, it'll be the summer, Mike. Um, we're going to look harder at those, those numbers relative, that have been printed and discussed relative to Cumberland's lowest per pupil spending because we have had a drop in enrollment. We have had 41 teachers. Um, decline in um, employment in this school department over the last four years, and we've seen spending go from 47.4 million in 2010 to the current budget of $57 million. That's a $10 million increase in spending, Mike. 10 million bucks since 2006, uh, 2010. 2010, 2010. $47.4 million, page 61 of the audit, if anybody wants to look at it. The school department is currently asking the town for a, a budget, not asking the town for all its money, but they plan on spending $57.4 million. That's a $10 million increase in three years. How can anybody say that the past counselors in the current administration and the mayor's work to accelerate funding has not been supporting our schools? I don't get that math because I don't know where the money comes. Where else do you get more than $10 million in support, Mike? Okay. $10 million so, bucks. These are real numbers. So, so I guess I would just follow up with the questions about, you know, when I go to school committee meetings, I hear a lot about unfunded mandates by the state. For example, um, you know, we're going away from the kneecap testing in, in the next couple of years to a new form of testing. I can't remember the name of it it's off the top of my head. It's entirely computer-based, which means, and this is a state-imposed requirement, that the schools are now going to have to purchase computers so that the students can take a required test. So uh, how do you balance the needs of, you know, a required pension, <clears throat> unfunded mandates at, at the school level? Um, you know, if I, I'll tell you, if I had the answer to that question completely, it'd probably be the, the President of the United States. It's a good question, and it's and it's something I am dealing with. I am, I am committed to. And here's what I've learned about this process. Last summer, running for public office for the first time, getting into office and using the skills that I've developed over the last 25 years is that I want to use good, reasonable judgment for the benefit of the town and nobody else. Not me, not my family, but the town. That's my mission, that's my job, and I plan on moving the ball forward. Will I score a touchdown? I don't know. I'm going to say I won't. Because if I do, then I'll exceed expectations. But I will move the ball forward. I'll guarantee you that. I will move the ball forward to do all the things you just said need to be done. And they all need to be done. Let's ask Bill Belichick. Does he have the highest payroll in the, in the NFL? No, because they have salary caps. He has the same payroll. But how, does, how come he ends up in the Super Bowl game every year? Why? Because he knows how to allocate those resources to the best of his ability. He's the best at doing it. 
And when you're, when, you're, when you're forced to work with less, you tend to do better with less. And you need to allocate those resources in a way that gets you the maximum efficiency and results. We've got good leadership in Dr. Thornton, I believe, in that school department. I think the search committee did a fine job with him. We've got wonderful teachers, community leaders. They're, they participate in all sorts of volunteer um, activities in this town. We've got great teachers. We need to employ, employ that leadership, those leadership skills and, and make sure those assets are allocated in the best way possible. I'll just end with this because I know you want to finish up. Yeah. I know that you've reviewed the school budget. You know, I listen to school committee after school committee meeting. Everybody tells me that, I mean, show me where the fat is in the budget that, that you know, where this extra $10 million has come from over the last couple of years. Where do we cut to save money so that, I mean, I was at the, I was at the meeting, at their very last meeting, they're struggling to figure out how to allocate buses in just the right way to accommodate their schedules. When Lincoln, the next town over, has 2,000 less students and has the same has the same number of buses that we do, so uh, I, you know I, I understand that there's sometimes uh, some misinformation out there um, and people not understanding the process. But everybody's telling me that the, the school budget is, has been whacked and whacked and whacked, and and it's normal for for payroll to increase. I mean, we have agreements with unions. I, I don't know that you know I hear about taxes being decreased. I don't know how that's possible when your largest employer, the school department, you know, has to pay people. I mean when when's your pay gone down? I mean that doesn't I mean that's kind of a personal question, but I can tell you from my, the work that I do that a lot of people's I mean fifteen to twenty percent of your neighbors who have lost a hundred percent of their income, Mike. In the I'm last talking about years. If people that are employed. What company goes in and says we're going to cut? They might not cut the existing people, but they lay people off. Mike. So, so you can't lay off teachers. What are you going to have a classroom of fifty? No. Well, well, Detroit did that, and I'm sure the results were terrible. You know, and I'm not advocating that. But um, some people are forced to do that. I'm not saying that's where we're at, but. Um, there are systemic financial challenges or issues in that school department that need to be addressed by Chairman Bellio and Mr. Mutter. So are, as are, do we still give pensions to 50-year-old people, 55-year-old people in the school department? Well, do we have a choice? You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, that's a, that's a, it's a state pension, and uh, you know, I, I really don't know the exact answer and all the intricacies of the pension. But let me do this. I, I do want to touch upon the fire department before we go. And I do have to run this evening. But Mike, your points are well taken. But I, I, here's what I got to tell you. And the, the numbers speak for themselves. I, I actually got most of them directly from the finance department of the school. 2010, they spent, based on the audited numbers, just over 47 million. This year, the school department, from what I understand, in another week or two, I will see the school department has come to the town looking for, and their duck budget right now is a $57 million budget in three years. It's a $10 million increase, Mike. And um, during these times, with the tax base that we've got in this town, we don't have casinos, we don't have malls, um, we, we've got to do better. We, we've, we've got to do better because where does this money come from? You know? So um, let me touch upon um, the fire, the fire um, merger, okay, briefly. Sure. When I first got appointed to the um, town council, <clears throat> Scott Schmidt, fellow Republican of mine, and Bill Murray, a Democrat from Cumberland Hill, were appointed to a town council fire consolidation subcommittee. So the three of us were charged with um, coming to the full council with a plan. Why the town council? Well, if you recall, back in November 2010, there was a referendum that we all voted on if we were voting back then in 2010. And in town? And uh, let's read this real quick. The resolution said, shall the, town, shall the Cumberland Town Council be empowered to implement improved fire service delivery in Cumberland through the conduct of a comprehensive feasibility planning assessment with input from key stockholders, service providers, personnel of the current four fire districts, and members of the public, leading to the establishment 
of the state-of-the-art fire services delivery, delivery agency by January 1st, 2013. This consolidated agency could be an independent or municipal town or regional fire or rescue service agency. 80% of the taxpayers voted for this consolidation. They voted for this study. They voted to empower the town council with the ability to implement improved fire services through the conduct of a study. So, before I was uh, elected, a consultant was vetted, hired by the town, and a study was undertaken. A gentleman by the name of Don Jacobs did a study. Went to the all four fire districts. He had been a town manager in the past. His partner was a fire, a fire chief up in North Andover, Massachusetts. They developed a plan, and what they basically said is, you've got a lot of options there in Cumberland, um, but um, the, the optimum solution we have for you is um, a 46-man uh, roster down from your 54-man roster town-wide, a $6.1 million budget versus a $7.1 million budget. And if you wanted to, you could even go to three fire stations instead of four. And he recommended using Valley Falls as the southern station, and then in the northern part of town, Cumberland Hill and North Cumberland. So you had the inverted triangle of Cumberland, you had the three stations. He didn't say close the fourth station, and the subcommittee that I was on did not say close the fourth station. But if we were going to keep that fourth station open, we were going to do it with um, fewer men in town. So we might have, instead of having three men on that fire truck over in that station, we might only have two when it pulls up to your house. So the fire consolidation uh, committee read this report. We accepted its contents. We developed a very, very generic plan. Take the four chairmen from the four existing fire districts, have the mayor appoint three more people and come up with a seven member panel, a new committee. Tell that committee you're charged with consolidation, give them a $6.1 million budget, tell them you want no less than 46 men, and let them go to work for the next 15 months. Give them 15 months to come up with a plan. Meanwhile, tax bills are running out, contracts are expiring, and over the next 15 months, there's some attrition because um, nobody wants a fireman to lose his job. So people go into retirement, they decide to go to a different uh, town, they move out of state because of their spouse, what have you, and lo and behold, um, your 54 per current personnel are reduced to 46 in 15 months, and hopefully uh, it's a go. $6.1 million just so happens, according to the Jacob study, would give the tax rate, would result in a tax rate townwide of, of $1.61. That's lower than what we pay in North Cumberland, which is the lowest rate of $1.68 per thousand. Subcommittee said, we, we don't want anything to do with $1.61. It's $1.71 as far as we're concerned. $1.71. We want to make sure we have enough money in there. And it's only three pennies more than what North Cumberland's currently paying. But everybody else in town is going to pay less. Cumberland Hill would pay less. The Valley would pay less. And the Cumberland, the Cumberland Fire Station folks would pay less. Everybody would pay less, except for North Cumberland would pay three pennies more per thousand. So a $200,000 house would cost someone about six bucks extra. And now we're consolidated. And now we can work towards more efficiencies now that we're consolidated, better training, um, and some of the other things they had talked about, realignment of assets, putting a rescue in the northern end of the town and keeping them, instead of keeping them both in the southern. Um, at some point, integrating rescue and fire services like they do in most other, most other cities and towns. Most of the cities and towns, the rescue and the firemen are cross-trained. In fact, in Massachusetts, most of them are paramedics. And you're, if you're a fireman, you're a paramedic. And if you're a paramedic, you're a fireman. And here we have paramedic, and you're a fireman. So this is what the town council was asked to do. And um, we did it. We did it in about two short months to come up with a plan. And in this room, about a month ago, um, we were asked to abandon our, our plan and move aside because um, a plan that was going to be drafted by uh, the state and the mayor's office was going to basically um, move this plan aside. So what we've got Wednesday night is a resolution that was presented to us over the weekend. The first I saw of it was Friday afternoon when I got my board packet. Um, it said that the town council 
Um, apparently the mayor's office wants the town council to approve a resolution that would authorize our state representatives to consolidate the four districts without a plan. So basically, um, give the state authorization just to dissolve the four districts, put everybody in one bucket, and be done. That's the plan. That's the plan. I don't know. Would you marry someone without looking at them? Would you buy a car without asking what the price is? Would you merge your business before asking what the benefits are? The answer is no. It's that simple. Do I want consolidation? Of course I do. I've been fighting for it for three years. But do I want consolidation bad enough not to know what the plan is? I can't tell you I do. I need to know, I need to know what the plan is. I need to know we're going to have a certain, at least a certain minimum number of men. And we're not only going to have a north and a south station. I want at least 46 men. Because I know we can, we can service this, this town with at least 46. I want to know what my tax rate's going to be. I don't want to give someone a blank checkbook and say, here, consolidate. And then someone comes back and says, oh, yeah, we consolidated your tax rates now 208 instead of $1.68 in North Cumberland. And instead of $1.72 in Cumberland Hill, it's 208 in Cumberland Hill, too. So we're at crossroads there, and I'm sure you'll read all about it next week in the, in the Valley Breeze. But consolidation, absolutely. Consolidation without a plan, that's problematic. I, I just don't know what business deal you would get into um, w without knowing what the details are. So um, that's where we are on fire consolidation. Got a few more minutes left for questions. Did the state have a lot of power in relation to this? Different plan or different implementation? Well, that's a question that we, we currently have because the, the four five districts are very unique governmental agencies. Let me put it this way. We all know the woes that Central Falls had, right? And we also know that the tax rate is a lot higher than Cumberland. What if Central Falls went to the state and said, hey, we would like to merge Cumberland and Central Falls together so we can consolidate. People in Central Falls are going, nice. To keep people in Cumberland, what's going to happen to your tax rate? It's going to go up. Um, does any one governmental agency have the ability just to trump another gov governmental unit like that? And that's what those, the, the five districts are very, very unique in that perspective. So. Um, I don't feel that the state does have that ability. Our plan was take the plan that I outlined, three-legged three, three -legged plan, a budget, a tax rate, a new board, and a minimum number of men. So you knew, kind of knew what you would get. Take it to the four districts in June during most of the annual meetings, in June, and say, listen, here's the plan to consolidate. Yes or no? If they said yes, then you go and you say, okay, this district and all four, all four districts agreed to consolidate. Here's the specs. Here's the three things we want out of it. And then you go to the state and you ask them, please, the taxpayers want to consolidate. Can you please consolidate us? Instead, we're going to the state and ask them to consolidate us before we go into the taxpayers who run the shop. The taxpayers run that fire district. They're the owners. Not the trustees, not the firemen, not the mayor, not the town council, nobody. It's the taxpayers in those four districts. And to be trumped, to have it taken away from you the, and, those, and those rights and abilities, I don't agree with it at all. I think you need to go to the four or five districts first, that was the original plan, and ask them what they think. Tell them what your plan is. Or tell them, I don't have a plan. I want to consolidate. I bet you they're going to say no. I know you're aware of it. Most people are if they read the paper. You have the competing plan. Now being, you have the, the other study group yeah. and come up and they're, they're coming up with a totally different picture and they're saying this doesn't even meet the minimum requirement for fire protection. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that. There's a Barone report done by, um, I think it was Cumberland Hill Fire Department for the four districts. So, and it, it basically what it basically what it said is, um, you know, you got, four, you got 54 men right now. Even that's not enough. You need to hire more men. Okay, so 46 is out of the question. 
But the report was flawed in that um, it didn't consider mutual aid. So in other words, um, there's a whole bunch of fire, uh, come, uh, Lincoln fire stations right along our western border in Cumberland. And we also have some support from uh, some other towns, uh, Central Falls and, and some other towns that have Woonsocket stations that are relatively close by that could get to a fire in Cumberland within the allowed response time limits and, and be counted towards the minimum manning. And that report didn't reference any, anything about um, mutual aid. And we all know from living here that you do, will see a truck from another town show up here when there is uh, something terribly wrong in town. What you just discussed is what, what I was going to you, you answer a question before I actually asked it. You know, what's your opinion of the counter proposals, which you just elaborated on? Yeah, I, that, that, the report, unfortunately, if he considered mutual aid, I would have given a lot more credibility to that report. As soon as he didn't, which the the regulations, the NFPA standards that govern those that, that, that assessment, those response times and the minimum manning, clearly allow for that and provide for it. It's built in. Listen, you can't look at your town just as one little inverted triangle when you've got four fire stations within a mile and a half of the fire station that's over here in Cumberland. Um, it's, their fire stations are closer to a lot of our residents in that part of town than our own fire stations are, Albion and the like. So um, you, you've, the, the, the NF, PA standards allow you to consider those types of things, and it's just reasonable. So I, I lost a lot of credibility for that report when I when I when I read that. And I've read a lot of stuff, and, I, and I'm I'm not searching just for facts that support my position. I'm sir, I've been fact finding for, for a lot of things for three years. For people to tell me I'm learning, this is all new to me. I was I'm not a fireman. Um, I'm a CPA by trade. But I've been fact-finding, and I, I've enjoyed having people tell me their opinions and point me in the right directions, and I enjoy facts. So I'm fact-driven. So if I got my facts for, wrong, I certainly want to know about it. If I, if I have my facts correct, then I, I want to voice my opinion and, and let you know what I would think is a reasoned business slash personal person who cares about his community and, and wants uh, nothing but good things. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, Bill. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and I would encourage you to call me. Um, my phone number's up here, my email's here, um, or track me down around town. Just call me at my office, I'm listed. We can find you. And I'll be glad to talk with you more about any of these items, all right? Thank all you right. for your support and your time. Thanks. All right, uh, Cosman, no? Ex councilman, I, I appreciate the offer though, but I thought about it more. It wouldn't be fair if he was the. All right, very good. Without Mr. Lane here, but I did welcome the opportunity to come back while he was here so we could have. Uh, That's separate, fine. Separate some numbers. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Just want you to know you had the opportunity. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. That was uh, very helpful for me. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, my own. Uh, my own take on this here, again, on the, on the tax situation, you can't take the tax levy that's being imposed on the people and just take it out of context, out of the community. You ha it has to be in context with the community that you're in. Some communities in Rhode Island are very high income communities. They have a different base of residents. Most of them are working in high level jobs. Here in Cumberland, we have a high level of elderly people like me, okay, we're on fixed incomes. Our incomes haven't gone up substantially in the last five or six years, more for some people. Uh, the people that are in the workplace right now are seeing their hours reduced, they're seeing their pays reduced, they're seeing their benefits reduced. Taking in that context, a 1% tax increase can be very onerous. And the entire state of Rhode Island is seeing people leave the state. It's not a myth, it's a fact. And why are they leaving? Because of taxes. They can't afford to live here anymore. All right? So government overall has to do a better job of spending your tax dollars. Bye, thank you. Right? And we've got to hold people like Arthur Lambie responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> But he's doing a good job, I think, anyway. I think the, I think the whole town council is. Uh, I sent out an email to you people saying how much I appreciate the efforts of the people that run for and accept public office. It is not easy work, folks. They spend an awful lot of time on it. 
And for him to take one of his nights and come here to talk to you people about this, I really appreciate that. Sorry we didn't get to give him a great big hand before he left. Mm -hmm. But we can give a hand to former Consular Bruce Lemoy for the work that he has done in the past. Bruce?